You're watching Money Talks with me, Oscar Subakti. Coming up on the program, market jitters ease as global stocks recover from one of the worst sell-offs in recent memory. A challenging job ahead for Nobel-winning economist and entrepreneur Muhammad Yunus as he takes the reins as Bangladesh's interim leader. And how will quantum computing change the world? We end this trading week with a sigh of relief for investors in Asia as markets closed on a positive note. After a roller coaster ride, Japanese stocks almost recouped all of their massive losses from Monday, a day that brought back memories of the 1987 Black Monday crash. The week began with a dramatic plunge in global markets, with Japan's Nikkei crashing more than 12% on Monday, the worst day in over three decades. Well, panic swept through trading floors as weaker-than-expected jobs data ignited fears that the world's largest economy, the United States, was teetering on the edge of a recession. Monday's sell-off reverberated around the globe, sending shockwaves through all markets. Well, after Bloody Monday, investors took a pause from recession fears after dovish messages from the U.S. Federal Reserve. Japanese stocks rebounded strongly on Tuesday, marking the largest intraday surge since October 2008. On Thursday, fresh U.S. jobs data soothed concerns that the U.S. economy could tip into recession, bringing a painful week to a positive end. The S&P 500 marked its best day since 2022, advancing 2.3%. Meanwhile, the Nasdaq surged by nearly 3%. Well, let's get more on this now with Nadia al Balassi. She's a senior market analyst at Equity Group and joins us now from London. Really good to have you back with us, Nadia. Well, what a difference a few days makes. So on Monday, we saw Japanese stocks precipitate a global stock market sell-off. Now they've largely recovered. Tell us more about why investors have had their fears eased. So I think this is closely tied with the labor market data from the U.S., which reflects the uh, weakness of the U.S. economy and sparks recession concerns. Um, however, yesterday we got the uh, jobless claims, which came in less than expected um, and uh, sorry, uh, better than expected. And that was a really good sign for U.S. stocks. We've seen a rebound in almost all uh, major indices. We've seen a rebound as well in uh, the commodity landscape, which has also uh, taken a large hit since Monday. We've seen gold prices surpass again the uh, critical level of 2,400. Um, I think the labor market um, is really closely tied with risk sentiment right now, just as cryptocurrencies are. So the more uh, we get uh, better economic indicators, and I think next week's focus will be on the consumer price data from the U.S., uh, inflation data, in which it, if it came in line with expectations, that would be also another good cue for the U.S. stock market and uh, the Asian stock market as well as it tracks uh, Wall Street gains. So I think this would be the next uh, focus for us. And Nadi, we know some stocks fared better than others. The so-called Magnificent Seven, which includes the major tech players, lost more than $650 billion in a matter of days. The AI pioneer NVIDIA was particularly hard hit. We know NVIDIA has enjoyed an amazing run over the last 12 months. Explain to us why tech stocks really suffered during this rout. Correct. So uh, tech stocks, uh, the opening of the positions for tech stocks after the slump, it was hit. Uh, so people had to close their carry trades, especially after the Bank of Japan raised interest rates and it was quite unexpected. So after they raised their interest rates, uh, investors had to close their carry trades where they uh, lo they get loans with the weak yen. Um, so they had to close these positions uh, in order to benefit from the interest rate gap between the US and uh, the Japanese economy, which was obviously very high because uh, Japan, they had uh, very low interest rates. The US has around 5.25% uh, to 5.50% uh, of interest rates. So they would benefit from this gap. So when they closed their carry trades, uh, they had to also uh, close uh, to basically help their positions in the U.S. stock market. And that's where the uh, 
the struggles that happened between tech stocks as well as uh, also the risk sentiment. Uh, it was hardly hit. But I think there was an exaggeration, uh, obviously, when everything went in the red, the sell off continued. It panicked. There was market panic um, solely sparked by the weak and uh, the weak uh, labor market data. However, now if we focus on uh, data dependent because the Fed's uh, policy is very data dependent, which is why we get um, so like a huge market reaction when it comes to labor market in particular. Okay, Nadia al Balassi, we'll leave it there, but it's great to get your analysis as always. Thanks again for joining us. From virtual assistants that manage our schedules to sophisticated algorithms that personalize our online experiences, artificial intelligence has made a splash in our daily lives. But just as we get comfortable with this new technology, another game changer is on the horizon, quantum computing. Omar Bakalolu reports. Imagine a world where cyber attacks are a thing of the past and new drugs are developed in the blink of an eye. This isn't a sci-fi dream, it's the promise of quantum computers. And this technology revolution is closer than you think. Uh, so this is a yeah, super exciting time now for quantum computing because they've got to the point where the physical qubits are good enough. So they've reached the threshold, the quantum error correction threshold, which means that the challenge now is to scale up uh, into uh, qubit numbers and to add error correction into these systems. These super smart machines can handle a bunch of stuff at once because it uses quantum bits that can be zero or one simultaneously, allowing for vastly more complex calculations. In contrast, regular computers use classical bits that can only be either zero or one at any given time. I mean, quantum computing is not going to be just slightly better than the previous computer. It's going to be a huge step forward, um, and that has wide implications. And I think people um, have, I think one of the learnings from ChatGPT is that, that those can be really, really big and, and important, and that um, uh, not being surprised and being ready and understanding the technology early on can help mitigate some of the challenges that come uh, as the technology emerges. The magic of quantum computing isn't just in its speed or power, it's also in its potential to make our digital lives safer and more secure. Researchers in Scotland are working on a national quantum network that could reshape data security. Potentially, you can have ultra-secure systems. Now, the systems themselves, of course, the, the, there's a lot more to it than that. One has to make the, the end users secure. Possibly, um, we would use algorithmics, non-quantum non encryption methods, and create hybrid approaches. But essentially, it gives a degree of security that is extremely high um, and potentially unhackable, but it would have to be used in certain ways to do that. The impact of quantum computing goes beyond security. It could also revolutionize fields like drug development and climate science, tackling problems that classical computers can only dream of solving. A, a quantum internet, which obviously I've described mainly in terms of security, can also connect securely quantum computers to give you know, incredibly powerful computing uh, ability. And here, of course, AI can play a role and it can be used for AI. In other quantum technologies such as sensing and imaging, AI is already being used. As we stand on the cusp of the next tech revolution, it's clear that quantum computing could change our world in ways we can barely imagine. So, it promises to be more than just a new chapter in technology. It could be a whole new book. Let's cross now to Frankfurt in Germany and speak with Dennis Kenji Kipke. He's the research director at the Cyber Intelligence Institute. Really good to have you back with us, Dennis. Can we get back to basics first? Explain to us how does quantum computing differ from the computing technology we see nowadays? Yeah, so we have with quantum computing a lot of different issues that have never been addressed before. So firstly, for example, quantum computing can exponentially accelerate the analysis of, of massive 
data sets, for example, also enabling faster um, identification of anomalies and data sets, or when it comes to cybersecurity, it is easier to identify potential threats uh, within these complex um, network and this enhanced uh, processing speed allows also more proactive um, um, threat detection, for example, when it comes to cybersecurity and also to response, um, so which are designed to withstand the computational power um, of future quantum computers, safeguarding sensitive data also from potential attacks. So it does sound like in terms of the business application, cybersecurity is one in which cyber uh, quantum computing can play a major role. Why is it then we haven't really seen quantum computing enter uh, the public consciousness in the way, say, artificial intelligence has? Yeah, so this is quite easy to say because quantum computing is, is very cost intensive and the hardware issues that we had in the past uh, were really um, big. So it was not what possible to integrate quantum computing in all different sectors, branches of industry. And we have also seen this case for artificial intelligence where it took really years to come down to really relevant um, industrial scenarios where artificial intelligence is used. And we see currently the same way regarding the technology of quantum computing. Uh, we know uh, several governments are, are currently pouring a lot of money into developing quantum computing. In what way do you envision governments using this technology? Yeah, so I think um, it's about the case that governments and companies, they need to actively prepare for this era through a combination of joint research projects, possibly um, development and of course also technical standardization efforts. So governments here are investing heavily um, not only in Germany, but in the European Union worldwide um, in research to develop and evaluate, uh, for example, quantum uh, resistant algorithms with the goal of selecting and standardizing the most secure and efficient options here. And companies, they are also engaging in research development, exploring how to integrate, for example, um, quantum resistant cryptography into their existing systems and their infrastructure. Okay, so really interesting developments there. Dennis Kenji Kipko, th thanks as always for joining us on the program. Now, Bangladesh was once celebrated as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Now it finds itself at a crossroads. The student protests that erupted on July 1st not only forced the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, to flee the country, but they also inflicted significant damage to the nation's economy. As the Nobel-winning economist Mohammed Yunus steps in to guide an interim government, the pressing question is how Bangladesh can navigate these uncharted waters and stabilise an economy battered by weeks of unrest. Well, the student protests that erupted in July have led to massive economic disruptions, with estimated losses exceeding $10 billion. Key industries, particularly garment manufacturing, which is vital to Bangladesh's economy, have faced significant shutdowns and operational challenges during the unrest. The political instability has created an atmosphere of uncertainty, causing foreign investors to rethink their commitments to Bangladesh. Some companies have already begun diverting production to other countries, undermining Bangladesh's position as a preferred destination for global supply chains. Bangladesh's economic turmoil has been exacerbated by soaring inflation, which reached almost 10% in June. Add to that a sharp depreciation of the Taka currency. These factors have significantly increased the cost of living and made it more difficult for businesses to operate profitably further straining the economy. Well, in response to the deepening economic crisis, Bangladesh secured a $4.7 billion bailout from the International Monetary Fund. Despite this, the economy has slowed, with growth projections for the fiscal year being downgraded as the nation grapples with rising import costs and the broader effects of the global economic downturn. Nigeria and Kenya, two of Africa's largest economies, are facing significant public unrest due to recent economic reforms. In Nigeria, the government's removal of fuel subsidies and currency adjustments have led to soaring inflation, while in Kenya, new tax measures have sparked widespread protests. These demonstrations underscore the economic challenges and political instability arising from such reforms. Nicholas Morgan has more. Chaotic scenes in the Nigerian capital Abuja on Monday 
as police fired tear gas at anti-government protesters. The demonstrators marched against President Bola Tinubu's economic policies, including the scrapping of fuel subsidies and the floating of the national currency. These reforms, introduced in 2023, have caused prices to soar, resulting in Nigeria's highest inflation rate in nearly 30 years at over 34 percent. Food inflation is even higher, making everyday life unaffordable for many Nigerians. The president has called for calm and wants more time. Suspend any further protest and create room for dialogue, which I have always acceded to at the slightest opportunity. But even more protesters have taken to the streets. They accuse the president of failing to address their key demands. Similar demonstrations have erupted across Kenya, following weeks of intense anti-tax protests in Nairobi and other major cities in June and July. Burnt-out vehicles and damaged shops are stark reminders of the public's outrage against President William Ruto's economic reforms. Over the last month, one month, the livelihoods and property of many innocent people have also been destroyed plunging them into destitution and jeopardizing the welfare of their dependents. These protests were sparked by a controversial finance bill, which proposed a large range of new taxes that many people believe disproportionately affect the poor and middle class. In Nigeria, inflation has skyrocketed making basic goods unaffordable, while in Kenya, the protests have not only disrupted daily life, but also jeopardized critical IMF support, potentially leading to higher debt and borrowing costs. The economic fallout from these demonstrations highlights the delicate balance governments must maintain between implementing necessary reforms and ensuring public support. Nicholas Morgan, TRT World. As Azerbaijan prepares to host the world's top environmental summit, COP29, this November, the nation is stepping into the spotlight with a bold commitment to bridging the divide between developed and developing countries. Baku says it will launch a climate finance action fund to address the world's most pressing environmental challenges. Uwe Shabanda has more. President Ilham Aliyev has announced his country will host COP29 this November. It is a unique chance for us to step in, in a, into a high league because we are not only organizing, we do a lot on the substance. We launch initiatives. We um, now actively work with uh, developing countries in order to build bridges between global south and global north. Petrostate Azerbaijan has made its first major climate finance move ahead of COP29, announcing plans to raise at least $500 million for green projects. Under the working title, Climate Investment Fund for the Future, this venture will include contributions from Azerbaijan state oil company Sokar and seeks additional capital from other fossil fuel producers. Azerbaijan became party to Global Methane Pledge. Our Sokar, uh, the biggest um, uh, energy company in Azerbaijan, they also signed on of oil and gas decarbonization charter last year in Dubai at COP28. This means that we are, whatever we are doing in the sphere of the cleanest hydrocarbon, which is a natural gas, we are doing it very, very responsibly. In fact, this way we are probably supporting and speeding up the green transition than anything else. It's an ambitious start, but still modest compared to the $30 billion fund announced by the United Arab Emirates at COP28 in Dubai. Nevertheless, Azerbaijani officials hope it will serve as a mechanism for fossil fuel companies to contribute towards climate action. COP29 aims to address the pressing need for financing climate crisis prevention and mitigation. Earlier this year, President Aliyev defended Azerbaijan's reliance on oil and gas, highlighting European energy needs. At COP28, almost 200 countries agreed to transition away from fossil fuels in a just and equitable manner to reach net zero emissions by 2050. 
Azerbaijani officials are currently discussing how to allocate the capital from their climate-oriented fund, potentially dedicating 50% to developing countries most affected by extreme weather events. In the lead-up to COP29, Azerbaijan has opened a climate information center in its capital to help the public visualize the very real impacts of the climate crisis around the world. Um, the main goal of this information center is first to give information about the COP, the conference, the events, uh, the importance of COP and its goals. Um, and the second and most important one is to educate and motivate um, visitors to at that sustainable lifestyle. Previous UN climate talks have ended in frustration, highlighting the ongoing tension between developing and developed nations over finance. The $100 billion a year target set in 2009 was only recently reached after significant delays and reclassification of existing aid. Azerbaijan says it is going to use its position as an energy hub to help enact real meaningful change. As COP29 approaches, the focus will be on upgrading climate targets to address the severe consequences of global heating, with Azerbaijan playing a pivotal role in facilitating these critical discussions. Ube Shibander, TRT World. In a land where electric dreams have come true, Tesla faces a new challenge in China. The company is recalling more than 1.7 million cars due to a software issue that could affect drivers' safety and the confidence of potential customers. Lara Kilic arslan reports. Tesla is making big moves to stay strong in China, but challenges are always around the corner. Imagine driving and suddenly the bonnet opens and blocks your view. The situation could be life-threatening, which is why the EV giant is recalling about 1.7 million cars it has sold over the past four years in mainland China. The company says it'll fix a software problem that may fail to detect when the bonnet is unlocked. It's never really great for an auto company to have recalls, um, but I don't think necessarily this is going to be terribly detrimental. I mean, we're also hyper-focused on Tesla just because of their stock prices and the news of the past few years, how it's just been a bit of a, a roller coaster of activity over there. Um, but I don't think necessarily the recalls issued this week are, are going to change its trajectory in any way, um, it's, especially if it handles it the right way, it handles it quickly. I mean, recalls are generally a pretty standard part of the automotive industry. China still remains very important for Tesla. It's not only a big market, but also a place where the American company faces lots of competition from Chinese electric car makers. China and the United States are trying hard to maintain good trading relationships. In April, Tesla chief Elon Musk visited Beijing to strengthen those ties. And the company recently reached an agreement with Chinese tech giant Baidu to use its mapping license for data collection on China's roads. China's very large-scale market will always be open to foreign-funded firms. The country will stick to its word and will continue working hard to expand market access and strengthen service guarantees. But Tesla has had some trouble with regulators and customers in China since 2021. The company reported lower profits last month despite cutting prices and offering low-interest finance deals. But it remains determined to fix its problems and keep its place in the market. Will these efforts be enough to win over Chinese customers? Only time will tell. Lara Kulicharsan, TRT World. Well, the auto world is rapidly changing with compact SUVs taking the spotlight, replacing their larger cousins. Panar Nishasta takes a look at what's driving this change in consumer taste. Becoming compact, but offering more for an urbanite lifestyle. Millions of sports utility vehicles or SUVs are sold every year. In fact, 79.4% of passenger cars sold worldwide are now in the SUV category, compared to just 45% in 2021. According to Germany's auto industry interest group, the VDA, the market success of SUVs is mainly due to the compact and medium-sized categories. Analysts say the growing appetite among consumers is due to better fuel efficiency, handling and agility than larger cars. Many brands like Ford, Jeep, Hyundai and Volvo have already released new CSUV models. The truth is we can have the biggest impact on sustainability by using less material altogether. 
Being smaller, the EX30 uses around 30% less steel and aluminium combined than our largest SUV. The global small size SUV market share has been more than $550 billion in last year, with the experts estimating it to hit over $590 billion by 2034. Much of that share is compact electric SUVs, which are already taking over the industry. The International Energy Agency expects the sales will reach 17 million units by the end of this year. The latest models of electric cars are becoming more and more impressive with luxurious interiors, especially with more fuel efficiency. Of course, that is very useful for daily needs. Electric or not, smaller size SUVs are preferred more by drivers everywhere, with more flexible driving experience, better fuel economy, and, depending on your taste, better design. Panar Nishasta, TRT World. And if you have any stories you'd like our reporters to look into or any questions for our experts, you can send us a post on X at TRT Money Talks. And that is all from Money Talks for now. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thanks for watching. Bye for now.